Okay, hi everyone, and just make sure everyone can hear, right? Yeah. So uh, first, it's a, a pleasure to attend this conference and to see so many interesting talks on a topic that I really love on quantum error collection. And so maybe let me start with a kind of a bigger picture on what we can do with quantum error collection, which can be used for different quantum applications, including computing, which you can do these surface code or different ways of doing error correction, and communication, which we can encode information and relay it over a lossy channel and still restore the information. And also, as uh, what Ken Jun talked about, we can also do encode oscillator into many oscillators to maintain the bosonic nature and uh, for simulations. And uh, the talk today, I'll be focusing on quantum metrology. And can we use quantum error correction to build like better quantum sensors so that we can sense signal more precisely? And uh, so maybe I guess uh, that uh, maybe some of you may still remember like around the 2016, at least for me, there are two big events which are important. One is uh, the detection of the first gravitational wave signal, which is in LIGO, and uh, this is a big optical interferometer that you detect a, a tiny bit of shift due to the gravitational wave. And of course, there are also other quantum sensors like uh, nanomagnetometers by MV centers, or even atomic clocks, which are really sensitive device. And uh, on the other hand, there's also like uh, advances in quantum error correction, and in particular, this uh, bosonic-based quantum error correction, which is performed in Rob Shilkoff's group at Yale, and demonstrates that uh, the break-even the performance, which is uh, the quantum error correction, can do as good as you can do with the best and encoding without doing error correction. So that's kind of like we're kind of at the break-even point of error correction. And of course, there are also lots of advances with uh, other platforms like trapped ions or superconducting qubits or MV centers and so on. So uh, for me, as a theorist, one natural question is, well, given these significant advances in these two directions, is there some way that we can maybe use some of the techniques of error correction maybe to improve the sensors so that we can build better sensors to sense the signal. And so um, maybe um, since I guess this is a quantum error correction conference and uh, maybe people mostly work on error correction for computing, but uh, I guess it's maybe I'll try to maybe also give some like a brief introduction about the quantum metrology and the what is the goal and the what is a, a good quantum device compared to a more traditional classical sensors. And uh, then I will show a few examples that to, see that, uh, to show that actually in certain situations, error correction can help improve the sensor's sensitivity. And then I will give a general criterion to show that uh, the, it's possible to achieve Heisenberg scaling. If these criterions are satisfied, then we can use error correction to achieve the Heisenberg scaling. And finally, I will discuss about further generalizations. So maybe let's start with uh, a the definition or the kind of the what is the quantum metrology and the what is the goal of a quantum metrology. So here I'm considering a bit more like a, a well-defined setting, which is how to characterize a parameter in a Hamiltonian. For example, suppose you have a two-level system, which there's energy difference between the two-level system. That is the quantity you want to measure, which you can use this difference to to define, to measure magnetic field or measure some other quantities. But here, in the theoretical abstraction, you just want to measure the energy difference between the two level, for the two level system. And uh, one way to do it, actually we can use a quantum system to, because the two level system is a quantum by itself. And uh, we can actually prepare some like a superposition of ground and excited states, or zero and one. And because there's energy difference, there's a relative phase accumulation between these two levels. And then we can actually use something called the Ramsey, experiment to measure this relative phase shift, which can allow us to infer what is this energy difference between the two-level system. So if we look at more carefully, the detailed procedure is you prepare a symmetric superposition of uh, zero and one, and you let it evolve under this unknown Hamiltonian for some time, T, and at the end, you do a projective measurement projected to the state which you initially start with or the orthogonal state. And then you accumulate the statistics so that you know the probability of getting being projected to the original state. And this probability is a cosine function of time and the, the oscillation period depending on the energy difference between the two levels. So you can see that actually the longer the time you wait, the faster the oscillation with respect to this energy difference 
which means it will be more sensitive to sense the energy difference if you can wait longer time. And you can show it more, say more quantitatively, is actually the measurement sensitivity of this energy difference is inversely proportional to the acqui uh, this acquisition time, T. So if you can get like a longer like a time, T, then you can get more sensitive measurement of the energy difference. And notice that this, okay, 1 over T, it seems quite natural from here, but it's actually something which we actually cannot do in the classical case. It's because if you have a classical device, you measure something, what you can do, given more time, you just do more repetitions. And the more repetition you do, indeed you improve the sensitivity, but as we know that the sensitivity improvement only scales as one over square root of the number of repetitions. And therefore, it only scales as one root over square root of the total measurement time. So therefore, there is a big difference in scaling for quantum and uh, classical. So that's actually what usually we mean the Heisenberg scaling, when you have this 1 over t scaling if you want to measure a particular parameter in the Hamiltonian. So and this looks good and it's, it works really well in the ideal case or in theory, but in practice this may not be the case. It's because, um, okay, but before I move on, so one key ingredient here, the reason it works is because we can have unitary evolution so that the signal accumulates coherently and then we can get this sinusoidal oscillation and get this 1 over t scaling. But in practice, however, there are decoherences. And if we have decoherences, then we will no longer just have a unitary evolution. So the state you get after some interrogation time becomes a mixed state. And suppose we have dephasing errors, then the mixed state you get, the population doesn't change, but really the coherence gets degraded. And the longer you wait, the, the smaller the coherence you have. So in the end, when you do the projection, what you get is there will be still some sinusoidal part, but there is an exponential decay of the amplitude if you wait longer. So basically, if you wait sufficient long time, you won't see the sinusoidal because what you get is just a mixture of zero and one. And uh, so therefore, it's not ideal to wait for a time which is much longer than one over gamma. So instead, typically what people do is wait for a time of order one over gamma and then repeat the experiment again and again. So if you have a long interrogation, if you have a lot of time to measure this device, then in the end what you ended up with is you just repeat this experiment many times with a repetition proportional to capital T. And then you restore, unfortunately, the classical scaling as 1 over square root of T. So this means that actually decoherence actually prevents us from chief Heisenberg scaling. And well, then the question is, can we restore the Heisenberg scaling in the presence of decoherence. And this is where actually we think that the quantum error correction could play a role <coughs> in quantum metrology to restore these decoherence, restore the coherence so that we'll get a better scaling in the quantum metrology. So now let's actually get to uh, maybe the formulation about so how do we like define, theoretically define such a question and then try to see if error correction could help. So here when I talk about decoherence, in th I would like to consider the most detrimental decoherence, which is the Markovian noise. So you can think of other decoherences such as like unknown frequency shift. It's a static in time. Then in those cases, you might be able to come up with a dynamical decoupling sequences to do it. But here, there is Markovian noise, which has no correlation in time, and you sort of really have to use error correction to suppress such noise. And so here we consider the formalism using quantum Lindblad master equation, which is a kind of a generalization of the Heisenberg equation with some additional term associated with some quantum jump operators or the decoherence. So, so here you can think that suppose you have like an R different quantum jump operators, and for small time evolution, you can think that the system evolves into R plus one different pathways. So for small time evolution, the dominant pathway is basically just uh, essentially the identity evolution wi with some contribution from the Hamiltonian and some like uh, back action from these quantum jumps. And there are also are possible different pathways correspond to like a different jump operators occurred. So that which, which occurs with the probability scales as small delta t. And here you can write this small time evolution as a, as a CPTP map with the cross operators KK. And the K0 corresponds to the dominant part, which basically you have a coherent evolution with, a very, uh, with some back action from decoherence. And the remaining cross operators correspond to 
some quantum jump process that happen. So, so this is kind of the formulation that we had in this uh, noise model. And then how do we model this uh, quantum metrology? And in order to model this, uh, to say, okay, what's the best you can do, we also consider the most powerful quantum metrology setting. And uh, this is actually with the most general quantum metrology, like, a, uh, like a, how to say, the, the framework. So um, here, it's for this case, it actually consists of two parts in for the metrology. It has a probe and has an ancilla. And uh, here, the probe coupled with ancilla for initialization, and then you use your probe to probe this uh, unknown Hamiltonian for a small time dt. Then you couple your probe with ancilla, and then use the probe to, couple to, uh, to probe the Hamiltonian, then couple with ancilla. So you're alternating this uh, interrogation and uh, this coupling so that you will be able to sense the signal. So the first look of this, you might feel that, well, this doesn't seem to be very general because you only use single probe, right? Sometimes we may have like multiple probes and prepare some GHD state, which could be quite sensitive. And it turns out the, that scheme, sometimes people call the parallel scheme. And it turns out that this parallel scheme can be efficiently simulated with this sequential scheme. The reason is the following. Now suppose you have like n probes, which is simultaneously acquiring the signal. Then we can, what we can do is just use a single probe and pl with n minus one ancilla. And every time I can just uh, shuffle with, uh, between my probe and n minus one ancilla to, to effectively accumulate this simultaneous sensing, but at the cost of extending the time by a factor of n. So with a little bit time overhead, factor of n, this single sequential scheme can simulate this parallel scheme. So this makes the whole analysis simpler so that we just need to consider a single probe with perfect ancilla. And here I should point out that since we're talking about uh, what the best we can do with error correction, we assume that we have noiseless ancilla, and also we assume we have fast and accurate quantum control. So this is really just uh, to see what's the best we can do with error correction in fighting against the worst noise, okay? So, um, and so basically with sequential scheme, is sufficiently general and it actually can capture all possible quantum metrology settings. So now let's actually uh, and put back to the quantum error correction. So the quantum error correction comes into play in these control operations. So what you can think is that you have now lots, uh, this ancilla could contain some of the fresh ancilla, which allows you to do quantum error correction to extract entropy from the subsystem that's doing the probe, so that you will maintain the coherence in the subsystem while you can continue in doing these operations. Okay, so this might sound a bit abstract, so let's look at uh, some more detailed example. So the first example is still a sensing a two-level system, uh, sensing the energy difference between a two-level system, but in the presence of random bit flip. So here the bit flip, I mean the rotation around the x-axis. Okay, so in this case, actually quantum error correction can help. The way it works is that just consider the simple repetition code. You have a uh, one extra perfect ancilla that attached to the system. And the repetition code will have a code word which is zero, zero, and one, one. And that spans a two-dimensional subspace. As we know that uh, we have two two-level systems, so we have altogether four-dimensional subspace. And the other two corresponds to, we call the error code words, which is spanned by the one, zero, and the zero, one, which correspond to there is a bit flip of your probe. So now you have this two, two-dimensional subspace, and then in the presence of a bit flip of your probe, then it will map this logical space to your error space, right? But you can detect such a bit flip by measuring the product of poly z of the probe and ancilla. And if that value is minus one, it signals there must be a spin flip of the probe. And what you do is you just undo the flip and continue. Okay, so by doing this, you can actually detect the probe as a spin flip, and if you do it frequently enough, you actually will make sure that you always stay in this logical space most of the time. Yeah. 
So now, of course, that uh, in this setting of the sequential scheme, we actually postpone all the measurement to the end. And uh, to do that, we can consider we have extra ancillars that are doing this uh, coherent like a detection of the syndrome and do the flip so that we can postpone all the measurement to the end. Okay? So now, as you see, that if we do this pr protocol, um, what will happen is that we can start from this logical space, symmetric superposition of the logical code with C0, C1. Then after small interrogation time dt, there will be two possibilities. Either there is a spin flip or there is no flip. And the no flip occurs with the probability as 1 minus gamma dt, and no flip, and some second order terms. And then if there's a flip, it occurs with probability gamma dt, and then the code this state evolves into something that in the code in the error space, but it can still accumulate the phase as you want. So now if we can detect the error syndrome, we know that whether it's wh which events happened, then we can actually, if the error happened, then we can do a unitary rotation back to the logical space and continue the data acquisition. So in this way, after the error correction, what effectively we get is to the leading and a zero and the first order, we get a unitary evolution under this effective Hamiltonian. And there are some second order terms but for dt very small, those second order terms can be neglected. So effectively, we get a unitary evolution in the code space. And the, the, the effective Hamiltonian is essentially the same probe Hamiltonian, but the tensor product with the identity of the ancillar. So now let's consider this is a one time step, and you can repeat many time steps, and effectively you get a unitary evolution in the code space, and you can restore the Heisenberg scaling, as I mentioned earlier. Essentially, just to do a Ramsey experiment in the logical space to restore the Heisenberg scaling. Okay, so this is the case if you have a bit flip. So now, let's consider the other case, if you have dephasing, but you still want to sense the energy difference between the two levels. Now in this case, we can first try the repetition code as what we did with the bit flip, but unfortunately, this encoding doesn't correct the dephasing error. And you may say, okay, let's try another code. Let's do the plus plus and the minus minus. Yeah, it does correct the error, but at the same time also correct the signal. So you basically don't get any signal accumulated. So the intuitive understanding why about the failure in this case is because error correction cannot distinguish whether it's a signal or it's a noise. So there's no way that error correction can help in this case. And of course, that one can show rigorously that this doesn't work. Okay, so now it's actually a get you a bit trickier situation that there's no guarantee it will work, but sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So it actually comes to a theoretical question that what is the criteria that error correction could help quantum metrology to restore the Heisenberg scaling? And this setting is slightly different from like a quantum error correction for computing because in that case we know if the errors are local, basically error correction will work for, for any computing. But for metrology that's different. There is sort of no guarantee it will work. So it's important to establish a criteria and say under what situation that error correction can help with metrology to restore the Heisenberg scaling. So now let's actually, now let, let me give you the answer first. The answer is actually the following. That what we need is that basically the generator of the Hamiltonian should not be like a overwhelmed, sh should be distinct enough from the noise that you have in your system. So one thing one might expect is it should not be the same as the jump operators. Moreover, it should not be the same as the kind of a second order, that's the L dagger L of your jump operators. And it turns out you just need to push to the second order, and basically the identity and the jump operator and there are some like quadratic combinations will span operator space. And as long as your generator of the Hamiltonian is not in, the, in that span, then you will be able to restore the Heisenberg scaling using error correction. Okay, so this is, in, in that sense, this, this notation is quite intuitive. It's saying that, okay, there's some part of the operator space which is being messed up by these jump operators, but as long as your generator for the Hamiltonian is not in that space completely, then you will have some parts which is orthogonal to that, which will allow you to do the Heisenberg scaling sensing. So, Let's look at two examples. One example we looked at is a bit flip, ro X rotation. Uh, so we want to sense the energy difference sigma z, but uh, the jump operator is uh, sigma x. 
Then the limb blast band will be identity, sigma x, and of course, sigma x dagger sigma x is identity, so basically it's spanned by identity and sigma x. And fortunately, sigma z is not in that operator span, so therefore, we can restore the Heisenberg scaling, as we showed in the first example. Now, the second example is that the dissipation is sigma z, and the signal is also sigma z, and unfortunately, the generator of the Hamiltonian is in that operator span, so therefore, unfortunately, we cannot restore the Heisenberg scaling. So at least the two examples we looked worked in this case. So now let me give a, like a, a sketch about the proof. Since this is if and only if condition, we need to show the necessity and the sufficiency. So, and, uh, so since this is the error correction conference, I'll probably mostly focus on how error correction can help. But let me briefly just uh, sketch okay, how that, uh, it's necessary to do it. And the idea is the following, that there is something in this quantum metrology community that they have a quantity called the quantum fissure information, which is a quantity that captures how much knowledge you learn about the system by measuring those uh, statistics. Okay. And then there is something called the kramer rao bound that says uncertainty of a parameter is lower bounded by the inverse of the square root of the quantum fissure information, which says the more information you gain, actually the better you can bound this, uh, the lower bound of this unknown of the quantity. However, if we have a case which Hamiltonian is li in this limb blast band, we can actually show that the fissure quantum fissure information scales only at most linearly with time. So therefore, the lower bound will be of order 1 over square root of t. Okay? So that's basically the proof shows the necessity, is that you do need to have some components of the Hamiltonian not in the limb blast band to have this Heisenberg scaling. And so in case you're interested, you're welcome to read these two papers, which actually have a, I would say, simultaneous work that could give the proof on this case. But for, the, for this conference, I think about probably people are more curious, okay, how error correction can help to restore the Heisenberg scaling in this general setting. And so here is the, cons um, before I show the example construction, and let me just give an intuitive argument of, and draw the connection between the error correction and sensing. So here, we need two tasks. One is to do error correction. The other is to do metrology. So for error correction, we all, I think the most of the audience here, are familiar with this uh, error correction criteria, which is this kniel Flamme condition. So if you have these uh, cross operators, then you need to make sure that the cross operator dagger, cross operator being projected to the code space is something proportional to the projection to the code space then that is the error correction criterion. And that will imply that basically if you have error projected to some other error space, then you will be able to find a way to restore it back to the original, logic, uh, original code space. And the second condition is the sensing condition, is that you need to make sure while you're doing error correction, there's still something non-trivial happening at the logical level, allow you to sense the signal. And that can also easily formulate it as a projection of this Hamiltonian to the code space should not be a trivial projection. There should be something non-identity in the code space that allow you to acquire the signal. So those are quite two intuitive conditions. And now, let's put back our Lindblad master equation, which has effectively these uh, cross operators for short time evolution. And we can just plug into this condition. And this single condition gets evolved into two criteria, because the some one Lindblad is almost identity, and that multiplied with the other Lindblad will give you something like a Lindblad times uh, the linear Lindblad. And uh, then if you have this KK with KJ, then you will get this cross terms with the L and L daggers. So those are the two conditions that needed to correct the noise. And for this uh, sensing condition, basically you just like uh, carry it over and make sure it's uh, not a constant in the, in, the in the logical space. So those are the, the three effective like conditions you need to satisfy, okay? So now let me give the construction of how to construct the error correcting code that allow you to do error correction as well as sensing. So suppose that my Hamiltonian generator is not in the limb blast band. So I can write the Hamiltonian limb blast, uh, generator in terms of the part which is in the limb blast band and the perpendicular part. And notice that since identity is in the limb blast band, then therefore, that the perpendicular part should be orthogonal to the identity operator, which means the trace of this perpendicular part should be zero. So it's a non-zero 
operator but traces zero, which means we can write it as two parts, which has a positive eigenvalue part and the negative eigenvalue part. And the positive eigenvalue part, we can think it as a density matrix, and the negative eigenvalue part will be the negative of another density matrix with some normalization coefficient in the front. And from these two density matrices, we can construct a logical code by purification because we now can have additional ancilla attached to the system. So we can have this uh, C0, which is the purification of row 0, by attaching to the additional ancilla, and the C1, which is the purification of row 1, by attaching the ancilla. And the things, these two, uh, since G perpendicular is a Hermitian operator, which guarantees that the row 0 and the row 1 will have orthogonal support. And therefore, the, the, the parts associated with the C0 and the parts associated with C C1, they're guaranteed to be orthogonal in the code space. And also when you do the purification, then these other parts on the ancilla is also guaranteed to be orthogonal. So this is a construction of the code word, which actually come by, by my student, Susu Zhou. And uh, so if you look at the example we had, if you want to do the sense in the two energy difference with the spin rot uh, X rotation, then the P's, uh, so this is sigma Z with the uh, uh, row 0, row 1 being the 0, 0, and the 1, 1. So you get uh, this code word construction. And it's kind of consistent with this general case. Yeah. So basically, that's where the situation that this uh, lambda is always 1, then you just get a simple repetition code. But uh, here, it codes more generally. And uh, we can verify that uh, this construction with uh, the row 0 and row 1, which correspond to the positive and negative parts of the the orthogonal component, then it satisfies all these conditions as detailed in the paper. And then moreover, you can show that the effective Hamiltonian in the logical space corresponds to just this generator projected to logical space. And as long as it's non-zero, then you will have a non-trivial evolution that gives you Heisenberg scaling. Okay, so maybe it's a, uh, um, now let's actually look into more, in other more examples. And the one example which I started with is this uh, LIGO, the gravitational wave detection. And we want to sense the energy shift of a, uh, like a frequency shift, of, uh, the length change of an oscillator of the fabric pro cavity, which effectively is the energy shift of an oscillator, right? So which you can write the generator for the Hamiltonian is A dagger A. And the noise in these systems is actually photon loss. So the jump operator is A. So now you can write down the Lindblad span, which is identity A, A dagger, and A dagger A. And unfortunately, the, the signal we want to sense is in the limb blast band. And which means that, OK, for this particular case, uh, we actually error correction cannot help to restore the Heisenberg scaling. OK, so it's, that's unfortunate. But uh, anyway, it at least shows that uh, why it didn't work. And the story behind this is that initially I had uh, met, met with uh, John Presco at a uh, program review. At that time, I said, oh, yeah, we have this error correcting code. And uh, it will be interesting to look into LIGO. And we both are very enthusiastic. And then I give this uh, question to students, say, OK, it may, it may work. And after a while, the student came back, say, oh, no, it doesn't work. <laughs> at least uh, the code that we initially thinking doesn't work. And then we further generalize this thing to come up with this criteria and say, OK, why it doesn't work. OK. But that but on the other hand, it also guides us to say, okay, well, if there's some other signals, potentially we can, it may work. And for example, if you're trying to sense, the signal you're trying to sense is a curl effect, which is a dagger a square. And then, um, if the photon loss, then a dagger a square is definitely not in the operator span by these linear and the quadratic terms of the creation annihilation operators. Then in this case, our theorem say you can restore Heisenberg scale. And uh, the error correcting code, you can achieve that, is something like the binomial code, which you might have heard from some of the earlier talks I mentioned. So for example, you can create a code which has a fox state, n over 2. Suppose n is an even number. And another code word will be the superposition of 0 and n. And these two codes have the property that they have, on average, the equal photon number, which is n over 2. So which means that uh, from the environment perspective, just based on detecting a photon, you cannot infer which events, which state is more likely. So that allows you to correct at least a single photon loss. And if you do that frequently enough, you will be able to correct photon lossing. Meanwhile, at the same time, these two states have different variance of photon number. So which means that uh, the curl effect will have a different phase accumulation for the states, 
which allows you to induce a non-trivial evolution in the logical space to sense the signal. And it turns out that actually uh, we may also generalize to the higher powers of the Kerr effect. And uh, for these higher powers, it turns out that actually there are other codes which can do better. Something like uh, actually uh, so also come up with this construction called the Chebyshev code, which is detailed in this paper. And uh, the Chebyshev code, actually, if you look at that, it's very similar to the Ulrich dynamical decoupling because it's not equally spaced in photon number. The spacing is kind of very similar to the Ulrich type of spacing, which is cosine theta, where theta is some equal partition of uh, two pi's. So, um, so there's some analogy there, but uh, it's a com for a completely different reason. But this actually draws some like uh, intuition and also gives some like uh, guidance about uh, designing the optimum error correcting code. As earlier, like uh, I think uh, Kenju did some very interesting work in this uh, bosonic code, when numerically using semi-definite program, um, do the bi biconvex optimization, find the GKP seems to be the best code for single mode to correct photon loss errors. But here, for a different application of quantum metrology, it actually may not necessarily be the GKP. And it turns out GKP may not do really well in here because GKP really corrects a wide range of errors. And if you just want to sense the curve, it will be treated as an error and being eliminated. So there are some, like, depending on your application, you may want to design different error correcting codes to, to optimize the performance of your application. Yeah, because in this setting, you have another, besides error correction, you have another criteria you want to sense the signal. And that's actually play an important role in the design of the code. So um, now we've talked about this uh, condition on this uh, like Hamiltonian nothing limitless band, and there are actually like uh, several further questions we can think about. So here I list just a few. First is we talk about the existence of the code and give an explicit construction, but is that code really optimal in terms of the performance? For example, if we have a Heisenberg scaling, we care about the coefficient of the Heisenberg scaling, how to maximize that uh, coefficient. And then that related to the optimization of the quantum error correcting code. So in this case, there is some like a geometric picture we want to kind of maximize the, the length of certain vectors. And it turns out that we can actually optimize the coefficient of Heisenberg scaling by some efficient algorithm, which is a semi-definite program. And in that case, we basically can find an operator which consists of the positive and negative eigenvalues, which, which purification of which will give us the code. And optimizing that matrix will allow us to construct the code with the, the maximum coefficient of the Heisenberg scaling. So the second question will be, can we encode, do the encoding without ancilla? Because as in the setting, I said, OK, we assume we have noiseless ancilla and ultra-fast operations. And uh, actually, in certain cases, we don't need ancilla at all. And those cases, at least we have a sufficient condition, is that if the jump operators and the generators you want to sense, they will commit with each other, then actually you don't need ancilla at all. You can just come up with a code word with the Hilbert space that you have to correct those errors. And uh, there are like some more explicit constructions, and for the sake of time, I, I just not showing it here, but you're welcome to look at the paper or ask David, who is also here, and he can tell you more about this construction. And uh, then another related question is, as you might see, that this condition is actually quite stringent because generally we'll have all kinds of noise, larger or smaller, and some of noise may be like, uh, okay, maybe not immediately detectable, but it's present. So in this case, then there could be some like weak additional Markovian noise which, not, which will violate this condition or which will make sure that the Hamiltonian is not orthogonal in the limb last span. Then, but uh, on the other hand, it's weak. So for these cases, we actually would like to maybe separate those noise and put a bound on the strength of the noise, and the inverse of which will give us a time that below which we'll have Heisenberg scaling and above which we'll restore to the classical scaling. And the last part is actually about sensing multiple parameters, which is actually relevant because, for example, if you want to do the single molecule NMR, you need to get the coordinates of many different nucleus. And that's a multi-parameter sensing. And for those cases, you actually want to see what is the best performance you can get. And to understand this case, well, we can actually rewrite this Limblad, uh, Hamiltonian not in Limblad's band condition in a different way. And this is if equivalent to, say, the perpendicular part of the generator, uh, the generator which is perpendicular to Limblad's band is not zero. Right? Or another way is 
the perpendicular part of the generator is not linearly dependent. You here we only have one, but when you have many, then you can get the perpendicular part of the generators, and you get a bunch, a bunch of them, and make sure all these generators are not linearly dependent, then that actually gives you the necessary sufficient condition to achieve the Heisenberg scaling to sense all these parameters. But of course, then there's another question about optimization, how you get the best performance. And actually here, like Warwick, and Warwick has a poster on this topic, and you're welcome to ask him um, about um, these advances. So maybe just as a summary, that we have this condition on the Hamiltonian not linear in blast band, which will be a necessary and sufficient condition to say that error correction can help you to achieve Heisenberg scaling. And uh, there are like a different like optimizations and also generalizations to the other more general situations. But maybe like a, a, a bigger, a kind of like a one picture, which actually I kind of borrowed the word unified from like Raphael's talk, is that here we kind of, what we care is the sensitivity, the vertical axis, the upper the better, the lower the poor. And on one hand, we can have a quantum Fisher information can put upper bound about the, what the best we can do. While on the other hand, error correction can give us the explicit construction to come up with a scheme to s achieve some like lower bounds. And if you can come up with a good upper bound and a good construction, then these two things can be very close and then you can say, oh yeah, this is the best we can do and we cannot do further better. Yeah. So this is kind of like a, maybe a just a, a cartoon summary of what we did in this work. Yeah. And finally, I'd like to thank all the collaborators and uh, especially like Susu, she did a lot of work on this one. And also like David and uh, Warwick also did a lot of work, um, as I mentioned in the last few slides. And uh, they're also here at the conference. So yeah, yeah, if you have questions, they can also help to answer them. Yeah, thank you very much for your attention. So <coughs> question, comments? So thanks for that. I was wondering about the LICO experiment that you sketched where you said, unfortunately, the mm -hmm. noise does sit inside this Lindblad span. But um, even if the noise does sit in the Lindblad span, you can still get a constant factor improvement, like I think you've said here, where you say t is approximately 1 over epsilon j. Mm -hmm. So have you actually looked at the numbers to see whether there's a constant factor that's large enough that it'd be worthwhile doing anything? or? Is it just that the noise is so large that the constant factor is going to be tiny and not worthwhile looking at? Yeah, so, so I think that uh, for that case, um, so basically what people, uh, so first of all, I, I, let me clarify. It doesn't mean that quantum doesn't help for LIGO. It does. Yeah, like a squeeze state helps, definitely it helps. helps by constant factor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so in terms of like the interrogation time, you will like uh, go to this like one over square root of t scaling. And uh, I think for LIGO, there's also like other considerations. They probably will not integrate infinite long time because there's also a bandwidth that they want to make sure that they can resolve those wiggles instead of just to get the average, right? So, um, but, but I think it's a good question that uh, we, we haven't estimated what this epsilon j is, but it will be good to know, okay, is it really a limiting factor or it's not, right? Yes. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thanks for the nice, nice talk and results. And then um, I have a question about the, uh, like uh, using the entanglement. Mm -hmm. It is well known that like, uh, uh, you, if you use the entanglement, uh, uh, the precision of your meteorology will, will go up. Mm -hmm. Is your error correcting code can work for the case of the uh, uh, using entanglement? Um, so when you say entanglement, in some sense we are using entanglement because it's entangled between the system and the ancillary. Right. Um, so are you referring to some different type of entanglement? Right, so if you use yeah. the uh, GHG state in the yes. initial state, then the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scaling of uh, precision will go up. So yeah. is the case yes. applied? So in this so case, in this case it's, uh, it's, uh, if I understand correctly, refer to if you have multiple probes, yes. and uh, with some entangled multiple probes, would that help, right? right. And uh, f uh, I think that it's, it's included in the setting the, of this uh, sequential scheme. If you do like uh, have a probe with uh, several additional ancillary right. to store this extra probe, yeah. then it's, you can essentially the sequential scheme can simulate what this uh, multiple uh, this, uh, probe schemes. Okay. 
So in that sense, it's, it's there. So I would say like if what we showed cannot be done, then having multiple probes with entanglement still doesn't help. Okay. Yeah. Right. And, but on the other hand, like, okay, maybe it could give you like uh, some coefficient could be better if it can work, right. which is still something could be interesting to look into. Yeah. In the uh, setting you've considered, you do control, and then you let the probe evolve, and you do control, and you let the probe evolve, et cetera. Uh, does this story change if you allow a driver Hamiltonian to act during the free, the, the evolution that otherwise would have been driven by this Hamiltonian omega g? And I, I think the answer is uh, it will be s similar, because what you do is, what you said is like a Troller formula, right? I'm just saying if you change omega yeah. g to like omega g plus h driver, yeah. Does the condition become that G plus H driver is not in the span? Or, you know, can you change the story by adding a driver Hamiltonian where before you thought, oh, yeah. there's no way I can measure this because G is in the span. And then yes. you say, ah, I'll add a driver Hamiltonian. And suddenly my new Hamiltonian, which has whatever the nature is doing plus whatever I've added to it, is now not in the span. And aha, I've solved the problem. Or, or no, does that not work that uh, way? If I understand correctly, I think that adding a driver Hamiltonian doesn't help because what you care is the part which is uh, not in the Lindblad span. Right, and uh, it's omega here, and you don't know the omega. And uh, it sounds like you're saying if you need to apply a driver which is proportional to omega, no, add then that will. Uh, then if you add a Hamiltonian, then what you sense probably will be your driver instead of this unknown Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, if the goal is to sense this unknown Hamiltonian, then adding the driver, even though the driver is not in the Lindblad span, in the end, what you sense is something that you added, not the original one in the system. Okay. Yeah. The question is, in this scheme of measuring and this Heisenberg uh, scaling, uh, how much quantumness is there? Because I can imagine measuring the classical oscillator, mm -hmm. right, with dk, and of course I will have the limiting time of one over the decay rate. And then, but then I also classically can imagine adding a little amplifier that would sort of reduce effectively the friction so that my period, uh, you know, the TK mm -hmm. rate will go slower and slower and slower. Yeah. And so, and so, so first question is, of course, I cannot do this, you know, the quantum wouldn't help me with a cl classical oscillator, right? But then this is a non-quantum scheme to achieve the same Heisenberg scaling. And so how much quantumness is in these protocols? And second question is, can you do, ampli can you amplify uh, LIGO? And change the uh, the error model there somehow. Um, okay, I still need to. I'm still thinking about the first model. You're talking about the classical oscillator with the amplifier. So when you do amplifier, typically you need a clock there. And if it is it locked in with your oscillator, or do you assume you already have the know the frequency of that, right? And the, the issue is that if you don't know the frequency, you keep amplifying, and later on it's out of phase. And uh, then, all oh, oh, you're saying about uh, doing the, even if you do like a phase insensitive amplification, you still sort of need to know what frequency it is, right? Because you need to have an additional ancillary system to dump that. Yeah. Um, but, but I, okay, I, 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 and I, but, but my guess is that, okay, classically you will not get that scaling, otherwise uh, the things will be broken down, yeah. So, um, and, about uh, the s so, can you remind me second question again? So li the LIGO with uh, a different strategy. Yeah. Well, what I learned from your work in particular that yeah. you can change the error model, for example, from decay ah, to yeah. independent noise by adding amplification in yes. the quantum setting in the setting of the harmonic oscillators. And the question mm -hmm. is with LIGO, can you do something similar and get a different effective Lindblad operator? Yeah, so I would say that probably it's maybe uh, one way is to think about the different noise model, and the other way is to think about the different Hamiltonian. So if there are some process that's happening around us which is not linear, not quadratic, right? Some like a Kerr effect or something so like that, then I think that for those cases, error correction could be helpful. And uh, those could happen if there's some virtual processes which induce some like a Kerr then probably that could be used to sense some like a 
particle that you don't see it physically, but it virtually exists, induce some curl effect. Yeah. So okay, potentially, I think there are more yeah. Question and discussions, but I think mm -hmm. we are pushing the time, so let's thank the speaker yes. again. Mm -hmm.